one. Joining me today is Elizabeth Rimmer, the Chief Executive of Law Care, an amazing charity that promotes and supports good mental health in the legal community. Welcome to Brief Encounters, Elizabeth. Thanks very much, Richard. I'm really delighted to be here today. So, Elizabeth, you, you've been working across quite a few years now in, in building charities to support mental health and obviously now working with Law Care. Just tell us a little bit how you got into all of this. Sure. So I actually started my working life as a solicitor practicing in clinical negligence. And I came into law with a science background. I did a degree in zoology and then landed up doing the conversion course and coming into law that way. And after a couple of years in of being qualified as a clinical negligence solicitor, I started to question if this was really the, the right path for me. I found it quite challenging handling the really difficult stories that we heard from our clients clients about their experiences in the healthcare system and wondered whether what we were doing was was really the best course of action that, you know, uh, litigation, I guess, at its fundamental level is about compensating people for financial loss. And many of the stories we heard, you could never really compensate people for what they'd experienced. So kind of got me thinking about all of that. So I decided, always thinking like a lawyer, uh, that my I'd have a year out and I'd do an MA in medical law and ethics, because that would look really good on my CV if I decided I wanted to stay in law. Uh, but to cut a long story short, I never went back to law. And I landed up working for a large global dementia charity through pure nepotism because my best friend from university's mother happened to be the chair and they were looking for somebody to help out in the office while I was doing my MA. And I just landed up staying there for 10 years and eventually becoming the CEO. So that led me in my path into the legal profession, uh, into the charity world. And then Fast forward, I moved on from that to another job, and then I was looking for a new role, and I saw an ad in The Guardian for law care, which I had never heard of, looking for someone who was a lawyer, who knew something about mental health, and they had worked in small charities, and I thought, that must be me. I was so excited about the opportunity that I actually sent my CV and covering letter to my mum to have a look at before I applied for the job. And so then I landed up getting appointed into law care. And so I've actually been here almost 10 years now, which I can't quite believe. And it's really been a fascinating journey being back in the sector, but not on the front line of delivering legal services. So that's how I came to be where I am now. It's an amazing story. And obviously having that experience in working in you know, charities, but also having seen the legal sector, Mental health and law has become, you know, fortunately a hotter topic, perhaps not hot enough, but has, has certainly come to the fore in recent years. Just curious, thinking back to your days in private practice, were there kind of factors there that you, you saw and working practices that have made, you know, we lawyers susceptible to, to mental health challenges? Yeah, and I think picking up on what you said that, you know, lately we've seen a greater amplification around the discussion about mental health. But it's really important to remember this is not a new issue. You know, law care was set up in 1997, which is almost 30 years ago, before anybody was really talking about the issues in the way they are now. And I think, as I you know, said at the beginning, my own experiences in private practice uh, did lead me to witness and experience some behaviors and practices that I could see were taking a toll on people. And particularly in the area of law that I was in, which was emotionally challenging, working with vulnerable people who'd experienced really difficult things. There was really, although I worked at a very enlightened law firm, I think there wasn't perhaps always the emotional support that we needed. Um, or should have been provided really. And I think, I think that's still the case now. And I think, you know, some of the challenges we face in law is that we've got an environment that's highly competitive, highly driven, 24-7, managing high expectations of clients, regulators. The insurers are increasingly looking at people risk alongside a thinking style of the people that come into this sector that is perfectionist, uh, self-sufficient, self-critical find it difficult to say no. So you're kind of almost creating a perfect storm for some of the challenges that we see in law. And, you know, and, and I think that the, the challenge we face now really is to change all this discussion and greater awareness into some tangible action. You know, the first study on lawyer burnout was done in 1987. 
that's a very long time ago yet we haven't really shifted the dial in addressing those factors that are contributing to it. And th- those factors you mentioned around lawyers being you know, perfectionists, detail orientated, recognizing some of those qualities or disadvantages in myself. But you know, how much of this is intrinsic? And so how much of this is you know, the, the kind of personality types that the legal profession actually attracts in? And how much is it extrinsic, the, the factors that you see in law firms and in-house teams that can contribute. I think it's probably six of one and half a dozen of the other because I think in the sector we tend to recruit people in with those characteristics and tendencies because we regard some of those qualities as those thinking styles as what's going to make you a really good lawyer. The cynic in me might also think that some law firms uh, and in-house teams perhaps are recruiting people in who are that perfectionist driven will go the extra mile because they will go above and beyond. They'll put in those hours and they won't question it because it's kind of expected. That perfectionist people pleasing tendency is that you don't want to be the person that's the outlier and doesn't follow the crowd in terms of, you know, success and recognition comes from. We reward in law the behaviors that are actually unhealthy. The people that exceed their billing targets are the ones that get the promotion and the bonuses. And we measure people on their output and their ability to put those hours in. So I think I think it's a mixture of both. It's definitely that, that billable hour. There's there's been that debate, you know, probably since the eighties on whether it's a good model or not. But still I think it is the case that most firms are billing by the hour, measuring, you know, not the outcomes generated, but just the work put in. Um, and it, it, it's interesting looking at some of the stats. I, I know Lawcare has done some amazing work in this area. I saw one report saying that I think 69% of lawyers surveyed had experienced mental ill health. In our own report of our community, it said 50% of in-house lawyers have experienced burnout within the last year. It's a worrying stats. I mean, is, is the problem getting worse? I think it is a really worrying stat. And I think whether it's getting worse or whether it's that more people are speaking up about it and seeking help for it, it hard to know. I do think there are some additional pressures in this kind of post pandemic world that we're living in where we're still feeling the tail of the impact of COVID. I think the experience of living through the pandemic has made many people reevaluate and question their life, what they want from work, what their purpose and values are, how that aligns with their workplace. And you're also now grappling with the rise in the use of technology and AI to kind of reimagine the delivery of legal services. And then there's greater scrutiny from regulators and insurers. So there's a lot going on in this environment that perhaps maybe wasn't there in the same way five or 10 years ago, which is is adding to the pressures that people are facing. It's hard to, it, you know, it's hard to know whether it's actually worse or whether actually the, the, the greater awareness in talking about mental health has encouraged more people to speak up with their stories than perhaps they would have done in the past. And, and for folks who are listening to this podcast, I mean, you know, we talk a lot about burnout now in the modern world, um, but obviously this is not a new phenomenon. What, what are the kind of things that we should be looking out for in ourselves, but also in our colleagues that are the, the symptoms of burnout? And what, what are the, the, the trigger points for, for, you know, for you to come forward and, and seek help? Well, I think you've got to, first of all, recognize that burnout is actually an occupational phenomena that was recognized by the World Health Organization in 2019, because I think burnout's become a word that's used a lot in common parlance without actually really understanding what it is. And the, the actual definition of burnout is where people are in a negative mental state um, and they feel emotionally exhausted and disengaged from their work. And we looked at this uh, in our Life in the Law study in 2021, and we used a recognized scale for measuring burnout. And the cutoff point for being at high risk of burnout was 34.8. And our sample collectively scored 42.2, which is significantly above that. And in particular, reported high levels of exhaustion. But I think when looking at other people, I think it's developing that sense of exhaustion, apathy, Perhaps people who once seem to be very engaged on top of their work 
no longer are. They're masking um, their ability to get on with the role. I think, unfortunately, what happens with burnout is often it's when people reach that crisis point and they physically collapse or are no longer able to come into work is when the problem arises. And I think with many of sort of some mental health concerns and in particular burnout is quite an insidious process that can lead to that point. So I think it's really critical that it's one thing about recognizing the signs, but it's also about recognizing what the risk factors are and that we need to be doing more in the workplace to put in measures that are looking towards preventing people from reaching that place where they might be approaching burnout. So that's about good people management, looking at the hours people are working, the relationships they have in the workplace, what that culture is like. Um, so it's, you know, I think by the time you're recognizing the signs, you're probably a bit too late. We need to be further upstream, stopping people from getting to that place in the first point. Now, one of the things that, you know, we, we work with a lot of in-house lawyers and often the in-house lawyers have had a journey that has taken them from a firm to in-house, and it's not always the case, but often you'll hear, I went to a corporate to get a greater degree of balance um, than I was experiencing in my firm. Just kind of curious if that's still a phenomenon that you see, and also what is it about firms that is creating that environment that is causing people to leave? And I say that, you know, as Magic Circle law firms are, you know, raising their mm -hmm. newly qualified salaries from you know, sixty thousand pounds in the UK. Uh, you know, pretty much ten years ago to now one hundred and fifty thousand pounds. Some things is happening, but what what is it about these firms that um, can exacerbate the the problem? Oh, I think it's a really interesting question because I'm beginning. You know, I think it's a myth that working in house somehow is less stressful or challenging than working in private practice. Sure, you don't have billable hours, but there are different pressures. We only have to look at the post office inquiry to see what that has uncovered in terms of working practices in some in-house teams and the pressure those lawyers felt to deliver for their clients and the challenges they face when your employer is also your own client is your client the ethical pressure you can be under, so rather the commercial pressure you're under can compromise your ethical behavior. So I think there's been a sense that in the past, you know, making that leap out of private practice into the in-house world was going to be this new nirvana and a bed of roses and life was going to be easier. Because I think it comes back to some of those things we talked about at the beginning, that the thinking styles of a lawyer are the same whether you're in-house or in private practice and also the business needs are still there and those commercial pressures are still there if you're in a, a commercial organization but i think i think what you're seeing people making that move perhaps is that um the the relentless pressure um that people face particularly in large city law firms and american law firms um to deliver those hours is a challenge and of course when you see newly qualified solicitors being offered these huge salaries i think it's now up to 180,000 pounds that comes at a cost you're not going to be paid 180,000 pounds for a job that's nine to five the firm needs to recover its investment in use i i um, think right. it's a and, you know, I, I think that people need to really, before making any changes about where they may perceive something as being better in another environment, is to really think through what it is about themselves and what, what they're looking for and looking to ensure when you make a move that you're going to an environment that aligns more with who you are and what you want from, from your legal work. It, it's so interesting that that point around in-house lawyers, it's something we hear all the time, which is, you know, the number one pain point tends to be in operational terms that we are buried in low value work and we can't get more resource. So, you know, I had a case, I think it was two days ago where um, there was a, a team of 1500 employees with two legal counsel. Uh, so one of the lower ratios I've seen, but, you know, really, really an enormous amount of business pressure with little resource. You know, one of the narratives that is now happening in legal tech is that new technologies like AI and other things, just workflow automation, can reduce some of the burden of that work. Um, and I'm always curious about the connection between, you know, can, can they come in and automate and 
and therefore in some way help your mental health? Just just curious, curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that's a, another uh, great question. And I think, you know, I, I, I listen to what you're saying. I think in in-house and in private practice, but particularly in in-house, there is a pressure to do more with less. So people feel they're being squeezed. There is that lack of resource. You, you may be one or two lawyers servicing a large organization and you don't have all that backup that you would have in a private practice setting. And I think with, the, with, the, with tech and automation, I think we need to see those as things in the toolbox that help us work smarter not harder and enable us to deliver our legal services more efficiently, more effectively and improve our productivity. But I think it's we've got to look at ensuring that that remains the case and that the squeeze doesn't become because you have these tech tools. Well, we still want you to do 12 hours a day, but you can now double your output because you can use tech to help you, you know, work even harder rather than just smarter. So I think that's, you know, I think that's going to be an ongoing debate. And I think what it does do, though, the rise of of using technology, you know, is that it presents that opportunity now to really focus in on the human skills that lawyers bring into their everyday work, because an automation pro- program is not going to have the trust, empathy, and judgment that a human being would bring in to that sector. So I think there's great opportunity for actually reimagining the conversation around, well, what are the skills that should be valued and required in the 21st century legal workplace? I mean, we're now almost a quarter of a way through this century. So I think, I think that's the great opportunity that we face now. And it, it's a very positive message, right? Which is, you know, all of these things like empathy and, you know, emotional intelligence and great communication, all of these skills become even more important, really, in this world. And not on that human note, you know, as technology aside, at the end of the day, uh, most lawyers have a boss and that boss is delegating work to them and creating their work environment. What, what advice do you have for those senior leaders, general counsels, partners in law firm to, to foster the right environment so that the individual contributors in their teams mm. can really thrive? Well, I think, I think number one, your role as a leader or a boss is I think you need to develop your own emotional intelligence. You need to understand yourself and you need to understand other people because you set the tone for your team or your organization around the culture what's expected around behaviors. And I think you need to ask yourself, why would anybody want to be led by me? I think that should be your starting point is to really think about your own skills and qualities um, as a leader, and you need to be a role model. And I think secondly, I think it's about looking out and listening. So it's about really listening to your people and your clients and understanding what their needs are and responding to those but also looking out on the horizon and what's changing. Change is hard for us human beings. We don't like it. You know, our brains are not hardwired for this. And I think there's a tendency sometimes to think that with change that, you know, this is a linear and rational process. It isn't. It's a roller coaster of emotion and it's messy. And leaders are expected or people are looking to you to help them navigate this changing legal landscape. They want to see your lead, the leaders be provide that reassurance and recognize what they might be going through. And I think you've already touched on, I think that and the third key point is about creating that psychological safety. It's creating that environment where people feel they're listened to, they're valued, they're respected. They can speak up with great ideas or they can speak up with concerns and they know that someone's gonna do something about it. If they make a mistake, they'll be responded to in, a, in an appropriate way about how do we learn from this rather than the kind of fear and shame that comes with making mistakes. And I think alongside all of that is actually becoming data driven. I don't think we do enough in the kind of workplace around people to actually measure well what is working. Um, and so I think that's really important that we really, that, that senior leaders see that that psychological safety is a critical part of their role in fostering that and speaking up for it within their organizations. It, it's, a re- it's a really interesting one, psychological safety and legal as well, right? Where 
you know, the, the demands of accuracy are so high and the downsides of making mistakes can be so big that certainly you can get into that into that motion in that world where you, you just can't, you know, making mistakes is really sort of bad. But, you know, of course, we're all human. Mistakes happen. Um, any kind of particularly kind of actionable tips and tricks for, for leaders to you know, actually kind of put, put that in place and make sure their team really can speak up? Well, I, I think our mistakes, you know, I think is a, is a great example in law is that, you know, as I've already mentioned, I think our response to error in law is, is fear and blame. And that there is that, that we're, we're conditioned and trained as lawyers that everything has to be absolutely spot on, that every I has to be dotted, every T has to be crossed, and that there's this sense that there's no room for error. And I think there won't be a lawyer in the country who hasn't made a mistake. And the challenge with that environment is that you as a leader and a manager or a business owner, if people have made significant mistakes that they have not reported or put their hand up to, that becomes a huge risk to your business, both professionally, potentially financially, but more importantly, reputationally. And you may remember some of those junior lawyer cases that we've had in England and Wales of young solicitors making mistakes covering them up the classic one was claire matthews who left a briefcase on a train um and she was struck off not because she left the briefcase on the train but because she lied about it but her starting point was she felt too scared to tell someone that she'd left the case on the train and you think well why is she in an environment where she feels that way so i think what leaders can do and i've seen it in a couple of firms actually and i think it's brilliant They've actually held sessions with junior lawyers where senior people in the firm have shared examples of mistakes they've made because it paves the way to give permission to other people to say, you know, this I've done this too. And so I think I think it's really important that mistake that the, the culture around mistakes is addressed head on by leaders and they set the tone by saying, look. We know you're going to make mistakes. We all have. Here are some examples. And no matter what it is, we want you to come and tell us. Because we all know from hindsight with mistakes that nine times out of ten, you can fix it. There might be that 10% chance you might need to notify your insurers or you might have to come to some agreement with the other side if it's in a link, you know. But you, you can usually deal with and fix things much quicker after they've happened than six or nine months down the line. So I, I think that's um, something that leaders could be doing more of is being open about the own mistakes that they've made. Yeah, it's, it's interesting coming, coming back again to, to leadership and just how important that setting an example is really to, to the more junior folks. I want to ask a little bit about the working environment now in 2024. So we've obviously gone through COVID and we've gone through the first wave of remote working. And, you know, there seems to be a pattern of some firms have remained hybrid, some have gone back to the office, some have been fully remote. But what's the current thinking now on, you know, working from home and how this interacts with working environment? And then what can that do for mental health? And what are the risk factors around having you know, folks isolated mm -hmm. and away from each other? It's kind of the $64 million question at the moment, isn't it, is about, um, What's, what's the best way? And I think there isn't, there isn't a straightforward answer to this. I think it very much depends on your organization, your culture, and your people. I think there are great benefits to the flexible, the flexible approach that working from home offers people. And I think in most industry surveys across the legal sector, even wider across society, I think there's practically not a week goes by where there isn't an article in the Times or The Guardian or somewhere about working remotely and the, the benefits that that bring and that people do appreciate it. But I think there's also another part of this, which is what I think law firms are struggling with sometimes is that not struggling, but wanting to address is that, you know, we are human beings, we are social animals and we make our connection and we build trust with people through developing relationships. And I think a part of that comes from being in the same space with someone. So I think it's about trying to get that balance of having people in um, in order to foster that sense of belonging and collegiality, the opportunity to socialize with people. Because it's when you get to know people, they're more likely to trust you and open up to something. And that isn't always as easy to do that online. 
But I think there's also the challenge that some firms are mandating that people come in on certain days. I've even read of some firms monitoring people through their swipe cards when they come into the building, you know, how long they've spent in there. Personally, I think that's a, what are you measuring? How long someone sent, spent in a building doesn't tell you if they had a meaningful day of interacting with their colleagues. And I think also when people do come into work, into the physical office, you've got to provide them with more meaningful opportunities. No one wants to come in to work and spend all day on a Zoom call or replying to emails because they'll just think, well, I could have done that at home. So I think it requires some thinking about, but I think flexible remote working is here to stay. And I think it's there's an expectation now that this will be part of a job offer and that people want that. And it's also about trust. I think we, we've we had some challenges in the past in law, that sense that you've got to be seen, you've got to be in, and that's how we know you're getting on with your job. And there's a tendency sometimes not to trust people if you can't see them. Um, you know, there's been some horror stories. I'm not necessarily in the law, but in other sectors, people having their keyboard strokes monitored and how long they're engaged actively online you know big brother watching you i don't think that's helpful so i think there's a lot still i think it's still a bit of the wild west in this in this era that you know we've got to think back that although the pandemic feels like such a long time ago it was only four years ago so up until about 2020 most people were coming in every day in the law. That wasn't really standard practice, this sort of hybrid working. Now we've had this big shift. I think the, the, the opportunity, though, is for organizations to, to look at this, speak to their people, and learn about well, what is actually working, what do our people want, and try to accommodate that. But getting that balance between having people in the real world together and also interacting online. And in your 10, 10 years with law care, I mean, there's been massive upheaval and change. I mean, we've talked a bit about the pandemic, financial crises, energy crisis, uh, of course, the second generation of AI changing sort of everything fundamentally. In all of this change, how optimistic are you about the future? Well, I am optimistic. My husband calls me a deluded optimist. That's what he often um, place to be. describes me as. Because he, yeah. Well, I think that I am optimistic because I think you need optimism to help you navigate this change and see that actually there's the potential for doing things better and differently. And I think we're at such a crucial point now where. We have the evidence around what's challenging our mental health and law. We've potentially got a whole range of new tools that could help people work smarter and more efficiently that would allow them more capacity and time for doing those things that support their mental health and well-being. I think you're seeing a big shift in senior people in law beginning to look beyond what perhaps their the confines of their traditional role. They're looking more outward. They're beginning to speak up about these issues. They are participating in the discussion. And so I think we're at this point where we've got this opportunity to harness all of this, to actually do something that makes some meaningful, tangible change. The, cha the change, the challenge is though is, is in the midst of all the things that are in everybody's inbox, it's finding the time and space for this. But I think it's incumbent on us to do that now. And if we don't, you know, we don't want to still be talking about all of this stuff in the same way in 10 years time. But I'm up. And the other great thing we've got to remember about lawyers, lawyers are problem solvers. This is what we do every day. So this is a problem that I think if you got the collective minds of the profession together, we could we could sort this. It just requires a bit of passion and a bit of real conviction that this is needed. There's a great note to end our conversation on uh, with some optimism <laughs> for the future and what, what we can actually change uh, here in the legal profession. Elizabeth, thank you so much for being on Brief Encounters. Uh, where can folks find out more about your work and about Lawcare? Best place to find out more about us is on our website, lawcare.org.uk, and also our LinkedIn page. All of our resources, information, tools are all there to be looked at. Well, thanks again, Elizabeth, for being on Brief Encounters. Great. Thanks very much, Richard. Bye. I've really enjoyed it.